it's not about you getting married. It's about picking a parent for your child. You know, we talk about all the time, like, oh, if you want your vertical leap to go up, get better parents. <laughs> You've got a chance here to get your kid a better parent. Don't fuck it up. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome back to another episode of Barbell Logic. This is your producer, Trent. Back in episode 196... The Secret to a Bigger Bench, the Leg Drive episode, uh, we were treated to another one of Hambrick's rules. And that rule was, don't date someone you wouldn't marry. Well, we got a lot of feedback and a lot of emails about that show, and Hambrick's rule in particular. So we thought, hey, why don't we bring an actual expert onto the show to talk about this stuff? So today we're welcoming back our good friend, Dr. David Pewter from the Psychiatry and Psychotherapy podcast, and of course, a lifter himself, Um, to talk about dating, and he has come up with a list of what he considers the red flags of dating. So we're going to go down the dating rabbit hole today and hear from Dr. Pewter about his red flags, the sexual marketplace in contemporary hookup culture in 2019, and some practical dating tips if you're out there on the market and you're trying to find someone to settle down with. Dr. Pewter's got some tips for you. All right, so let's get to the show. So, man, I said, you know, if you don't know the person, if you haven't had dinner at their grandma's house, you know, if they're not a part, a long time part of your community and you're thinking about getting married, you know, maybe you're part of the American diaspora. You know, you move from Bloomington, Indiana to Chicago, and then she moved from New Jersey to Chicago and you, neither one of you have friends in common and you're thinking about proposing, you know. Maybe you ought to get a, maybe you ought to look into what's going on here. And so David called me and he's like, dude, he's like, bro. So I, I'm, I'm actually, I thought you were going to come in and, and chew Scott's ass, but it feels like you're actually going to validate some of his claims. <laughs> Is you that know, true? <laughs> I've, I've been thinking about this. Um, and I, I, I was actually Googling like, you know, hiring a, private investigator for you know your girlfriend or, or boyfriend to check them out and th- there's this private investigator that wrote this article about what's happened in the aftermath mm-hmm. of like 3,000 cases of doing this and he said that usually someone hires a private investigator if they feel like the other person is lying right for some reason and you know there's basically two outcomes one is they find out like, oh, their girlfriend is learning pole dancing to basically as like a big secret, you know, right. or the boyfriend is going out with his guys and he just is like literally at a bar with his dudes and he just doesn't tell his girlfriend where he's at because he's embarrassed that he's just spending all this time watching cricket, you know? Right. And so the private investigator said, you know, in those cases, you know, if, if they tell the partner then it, you know, it's usually not a huge deal. In the cases where they actually catch the partner in the lie, right, of right. the affair, of multiple affairs, the partner usually responds with anger. Sometimes it leads to, re- you know, like um, working through in the relationship and, and figuring it out. But, but usually, like, in all the patients that I've seen where they've caught the other partner in cheating and then they confront them, usually the partner either denies it or he reacts with anger or, um, you know, often a very, very strong emotion. Like, how dare you look at my cell phone, you know? And sure, you caught me texting someone as, you know, and it's obvious we're doing like meetups and stuff, but how dare you break my privacy and look at the cell phone, you know? Um, And just absolute anger. And so, I, I don't know, I have mixed... I have mixed feelings about when you're in a relationship and you think that your partner's lying, how do you deal with that sort of thing, especially if it's early on? Well, yeah, I think that the way I would handle it 
is what is what uh, drove me to recommend this to people over the years. You know, if you're talking about getting married to someone and you think there's some crazy stuff up, or even if you don't, like I'm telling you, a lot of people have been, you know, they met, they're, they met, meet in a town that's not their hometown. They're not in their community. They date for six, eight months, a year, and then they get engaged. You really don't know that person. You really don't. You know, where's the credit card affairs? Debt? Like the, you know, you know where's the, the credit card debt? $80,000 in credit card debt. The gambling addiction. What if they were the, sexually abused by Uncle Joe? Like, you, and that doesn't come out until later. So, and, I, and I was going to say, in Scott's defense, he never, you specifically said, we don't, we don't confront it. No, you're just like, you're just I'm like, out. You know, I'm looking yeah, for stuff yeah. that disqualifies, you know, and if I see a big deception, if I see a big deception, you know, you're cheating on me. Like, I'm not going to have a confrontation about that. You know, yeah. uh, I was thinking about getting engaged. I was thinking about proposing marriage and uh, Dog the Bounty Hunter found out that you have another boyfriend. I'm, I'm not fixing that. Like, if, if, if I'm not going to get into the marriage contract with that person. I'm out. So, so, you you know, know, so if they're like, oh, how dare you check? No, they're never going to know. I'm just going to be like, you know what? It's not you. It's me. Uh, best of luck to you in all the future. Hasta mañana. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, think, I think that a couple of the complications in our society is, um, you know, we're not longitudinally invested in a community as much as we used to be. Right. You know, in the old days, like, you know, you were in a small community, you had a group of people who knew you really well. And because of that, you know, when you were looking to get married, you had a reputation based on how you lived your last, you know, 20 years of your life. Nowadays, it's like, there's so much movement in how people move around and, and so on and so forth. I'm curious, um, Scott, what were some of the messages that you got Oh, it's a bunch of a bunch of stuff about offending people's sensibilities. You know, uh, oh, go – somebody would say, oh, this is a bridge too far for you to go behind your fiancé's back. And I'm reading that. I'm like, this doesn't mean anything. What If that bridge is too far, which bridge is good enough? Like, what are you talking about? And then behind their back – how about this? Don't go behind their back. Hey, babe, it's Friday night. Uh, Monday morning, I'm going to go meet with uh, Dog the Bounty Hunter. <laughs> is there anything you want to tell me? And by the way, here's 500 bucks and you can do the check on me too. Like you don't have to go behind their back. Uh, m- maybe, m- maybe you do, but I mean, behind their back, what does that mean? Like you're free to make inquiries. You're free to make inquiries for Christ's sake. So, so most of most of the objections were like about the sensibilities. Uh, the, it's a sensibility. I offended their sensibility in 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 perhaps doing that. The other objection was, well, what about prenups? Why wouldn't you recommend a prenup? And I have entire arguments against prenups, but the prenup is purely economical. The prenup doesn't change the fact that you may have married a crazy person. You've selected a crazy person for your child's parent. No prenup can fix the fact that their parent is nuts or that their parent had another family and you didn't even know about it. Like there are women that marry a guy and he is married to somebody else in another state and has three other kids and he's a traveling salesman. Like that happens. The prenup can't fix that. I'm not worried about the money. You know, money doesn't grow on trees, but they do print that shit. Like the money's not the thing. It is one of the things, but it's not the thing. The thing is, did you pick a deceiver, a flawed, broken person to be the one of your children's parents? Okay, what is um, so? I think I think this led in in, a, in the prior conversation to something I've been working on, which is like making a list of the red flags in dating. Yeah, this is the good shit right here. Okay, and so. Number one, when I think about this person, I already want to change them. Mm. Yeah. David, I don't want to change a thing about you. <laughs> I don't want to. That's, that's very cut. <laughs> if there was one thing I could change about you, it would be that you lived you live. here rather than I was going to say it's where you live. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And who knows what will happen. Um <laughs> 
Would okay. So n- number two, would I want to have a, my future children with this person? Or I think what Scott said to me on the co- phone call is, would you want this person to babysit your children if you had children? Yeah. Like, would you trust them enough with your children if you already had children? Yeah. Yeah, I actually said that. That's how we Matt and I actually started that conversation on episode one ninety six. Was you know, you know, is this somebody that you would uh, that you would you know, have babysit your kids? And I mean, that's a pretty low. Like, even that is a pretty low standard. You know, babysitting is an evening while you go to the movies. You know, we're we're really talking about a lifetime here. But that's that's so that's sure. a, even that's a pretty low standard. Yeah, it's a great question though. It's a, certainly it's a yeah. great leading question to go like, mm, is that. Like, you know, just sometimes there's people, like, that give you the heebie-jeebies a little bit. You can't put your finger on it. You're just like, mm. Well, there's the heebie-jeebies. And then there's also just like, you know, I, I think he might lose his temper and, like, punch the kid. Sure. Or he's just so irresponsible, he might burn the house down. Like, the kids are right. going to be watching him. I mean, there's a whole, there are all different levels of don't want them to watch the kids, you know? And I would say, like, does this does this person have a history of violence? Do they have a history of domestic violence? I mean, one of the biggest predictors of future violence is prior violence. Right. Have you ever heard that story about Scott going off on that guy at the movie theater? <laughs> I wasn't no. violent. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> he did go off on the guy in the movie, but it I, wasn't violent. I will yell just, at someone. It was just vile. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Okay, number, uh, number three. Could I see this person being a good father or mother? Of course. Yeah. Am I feeling a pull to rescue them in some way? Oh. Mm. Right. Let's, hold on. I want to go back to the one before that for a second. Like, we, we, we glass over the, uh, can I see this person being a good father or mother? But I think it's important to realize that many, many, many people in their 20s and early 30s who are potentially looking for a mate children are the last thing on their mind. Most of them think that they don't even want children, right? Like we're seeing that more and more, like the more, more secular, uh, more educated, let's say educated, people more that educated, get up, people that they get tend up to have less heads. kids. And so they often go into this with like, I don't want kids. So like, why would I care if they're a good mom or dad? And yet we know biologically that most of those people will actually eventually get to a point where, I mean, we, we were like that. I was like that, right? Like there, I've, I think I thought maybe there was a day when I was, you know, when I was 22 and I was already married. I thought, well, there's I'll be, there'll probably be a day that we'll have kids, but I didn't really want kids. And then, and then one day something happened. I mean, and I, it, it was, it was really, it was almost more biological uh, you, that you I got up to, and I was do like, do you want me to tell you what happened? What happened? Well, sometimes when a mommy and a daddy love each other very, very much. <laughs> yeah. We have the birds and the bees talk. We, we weren't. I mean, you know, I just I wanted a kid. It wasn't. We weren't pregnant, right? right? So, but that, I'm just saying that I think a lot of times people go, well, like, who cares if they would make a good mother or father? Like, I'm not interested in in having kids. Like, well, hold on. Right? You know, I think a lot of people that don't want to have kids and ultimately do not, who are married, who don't want to have kids and ultimately do not have kids, I think a lot of it is they really don't want to have kids with that other person. David made a face. What do you think, Peter? <sighs> You know, I'm, I'm, hold on. I saw a I, micro expression. I did too. Yeah. I, I, I think it was a macro expression. <laughs> was it a macro expression? You know, I, I think that I, I, I know some people who I think care about their, their significant other very, very much and were willing to toss their lot in with that person. But when the metal, you know, when the, when it all, when it all comes down to it, they're like, yeah, I don't want them to be the parent. I don't, I can't do it with this person. And they don't. I've had a couple patients like that where they like they get into the relationship and they're like, "Oh my, I, I can't see myself having kids with this person." You know, mm-hmm. it's like whenever there's a divorce, I'm always like, "Okay, is there going to be a child custody battle?" Because that just makes it so freaking hard. Yep. Like I think that's probably one of the hardest things that any person has to go through because it's chronic, ongoing stress. Unless there's a good relationship, right? Which is why. Uh, I did an episode on forgiveness. It's like, man, you got to forgive your ex, you know, and like at least psychologically be grounded, not in anger all day towards that ex. And then this is the problem with the prenup. The prenup doesn't do anything about the cust doesn't do anything about or for the custody battle that may that might be coming. And even if you got a good relationship with the ex, David, and you even if you forgive them, 
you still end up having some step parent in your child's life that you had no say about, right? Yeah. You, and, 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 you, and, you know, the kids are too important. So marriage isn't about you, in my opinion. The mari- marriage is about the kids or the potential kids. Do Make no mistake. When you think, I'm going to propose to Susan, it's not about you getting married. It's about picking a parent for your child. You know, we talk about all the time, like, oh, if you want your vertical leap to go up, get better parents. <laughs> You've got a chance here to get your kid a better parent. Don't fuck it up. Okay. Well, and, it, and it becomes it often. Well, and it often becomes a. It's a. Gen, it's even greater than that single generation. Like we see this all the time. That you know, broken grandparents, broken great grandparents, lead to broken grandparents, which lead to broken parents, which lead to broken kids. And it's just this. It can start this like generational cycle if you're not really careful about what you know. You, you see this all the time. You see this with abuse. You see this with addiction. You see this like this thing happens and that leads to the and then the next generation are abusers or addicts and the next generation are and that's just one example. I mean, it could be any of those things, but that's this is this is weighty stuff. And, and even if you don't think that you want to have kids and you're like, oh, Hambrick, you know, my marriage won't be about that. You might. And I'll tell you that. And another thing is you might end up being the kid. You might fall and hit your head and be impaired for the rest of your days. And then this person has is your caregiver. You know, yeah. it's it's much bigger than like, oh, you know, they leave the toilet seat up and they've got this foible and that foible and can I deal with it? You know, it's it's more than that. Go, David. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I, I've met a lot of single people who say, yeah, they don't want to have kids. And then, you know, as I continue to treat them and they get healing for different traumas, all of a sudden they're like, you know, I think I do want to have kids. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I'm, I'm not saying it happens all the time that the only reason people don't want to have kids is some sort of trauma, but I've seen that a number of times be, be the case where it's like, once they psychologically develop, all of a sudden they're in a very different headspace. They want to be married. They want to have kids. Whereas like five years before they had no desire for that. Yeah. Mitigating some of this trauma can do it. Like you said, but we also know that the, the the story about the biological clock, you know, time goes on and we feel those pressures and you decide that you want to have kids where you didn't when you were 20, want to have kids when you were 23, which is a mistake, but yeah. you, know, think you change. Okay. So you, let's go back to number four. So what was number so four? Number again? four. Am I feeling a pull to rescue them yes, in some right. way? Let me just say, there are a lot of people who, when they are, raised in a family, they become the caretaker of their family. They become the therapist of the family for whatever reason. The mother and father are chaotic. There's a divorce going on. They become the peacekeeper, whatever. So they develop this role of like the caretaker from a very young age. And then they get pulled into relationships where this is exactly the same pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I think you need to find an equal. I, I, I think it's very risky to if you feel compassion towards someone then you should be compassionate but maybe not their dating partner <laughs> you know yeah we've talked about that with our kiddos that's not your As life a, project you're trying to find a partner not a not a fixer upper and then you're not equipped for it anyway you can't yeah, do once it. you're in an attachment relationship it's so hard to help someone else grow you, you, yeah. you can't even coach your spouse like with yeah, but don't you think <laughs> you know? don't you think that people are often attracted to that potential even from the very beginning right like they see sort of like they're attracted to damage this person's damaged let me i've got sort of superhero or savior complex i want to go in and f- fix them i want to save them i want to rescue them that's a so when you, you're using number four as this example like that's a massive red flag but i think for a lot of people that that's exactly what they're attracted to yeah, I would say that person probably needs to do some work yeah. on themselves, right? Yeah. If that's all they're attracted to, if that's what their pattern of relationships is, um, do some work on yourself, man. Yeah, we should be attracted to their virtues, not their short, you know, not their shortcomings. Uh, but you know, there's a theory out there, David, that you know people tend to select mates to try to gain an opportunity to 
repair a problem from their past, right? They, you know, oh, my dad was neglectful, and then they end up being attracted to dudes who are neglectful, <laughs> you know, and, and the, the, you know. It's, it's, it's called um, people have patterns from their past and traumatic sort of needs from their past, right? And so they're trying to find situations that are similar enough that then they can create a different outcome so that they can heal. Right. So yeah, that's, I think that's why it's, they're looking for that corrective emotional experience. The problem is, is that in a relationship, it's actually very hard for that to happen, you know? So in therapy, it's like, man, pay for a good therapist. If that's, if that's what's going on, if you're attracted to a certain type of person that's destructive, that's a copy of your parents in a bad way, like see if you can get some of that stuff figured out outside of a relationship. Yeah. That, that my experience too, is I, I don't know that you, if you work the same way, but, uh, that takes some time. When I, when I first started going to therapy, my, my psychologist, she was interested in the past, but we didn't deal with it right away. We're like, Hey, listen, you've got some self-destructive behaviors that are going on right now today in the present. And we need to, we need to, we need to change the behavior and it's going to take some time to figure out like the underlying stuff there. Right. So I had this, I think I had this idea of, uh, the first time you ever go to therapy, I'm going to lay on the couch and I'm going to talk about my childhood and that like one, I never laid on a couch and two, I didn't talk about my childhood for like 10 months. Like it was that, it was like, look, this is, this is, and I think part of it was, I think her, I don't, I don't want to put her words in her mouth, but I think it was, she can't change what happened to me when I was five. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't have any abuse or anything. It was, wasn't anything like that, but, she, but she, we can change what I'm doing today. Like there's some self-destructive behavior that's going on today that needs to be changed as quickly as possible. And as the layers, like an onion skin, as an onion comes out, we can sort of get down to that, but that's going to take some time. It yeah. takes, it takes a lot of time. Everything's material um, though. I've been seeing this one client for like f five years and the, first couple of years, I, I didn't even really get reality a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. I, the, the, the person has, has a pattern of joining the aggressor, which comes from, you know, being traumatized by her father, basically. And, um, it's interesting as I'm saying this, I know I could be saying this about 50 or a hundred people that I've treated. Right. And it's only been recently that she's been able to feel anger towards her father and towards men who are the aggressor before she just sided with the most powerful person, right? And so it's, it's like, it's only through attachment and through the connection that we've had and the trust that we've built that she's been able to feel some of the anger a little bit towards me and then subsequently towards other people. Okay. And so that it, the transference and that coming out, yeah, it takes, it takes a while. Now, if you're a single person who's like, yeah, I got some of these issues, I would say at least spend a year and get someone who's the best of the best that you can get and invest some money in it. But most people aren't thinking like that. Yep. They're just not, they're just not seeing how that could be of value <laughs> in perpetuity <laughs> for the next 40 years of their life. Ah, you know, so good. So money, so, so well spent. What, can you sp can you spend better money? That's the that's the problem. I mean, like Detective. that's probably the best money you can spend. So one example for me is like I learned how to appease people with narcissistic traits, and I found myself in my adult life, like in my twenties, finding a series of these people that I would make really really happy, and I was good at it, right? But then as I've gone through therapy, I realized like I can turn this on or not turn it on, you know, and I can see when I'm starting to, to see that I have a pull towards someone with strong narcissism and I can decide, ah, they're not really for me. This person's all about themselves, their own agenda. And I would just be basically a means to that agenda. Right. But it's taken like a long time to get to that place where I can then one, notice it consciously, and two, be able to not fall into it. Why, why do you think you were attracted to that type of person? Uh, because, I've, because, because it was adaptive for me early on 
to be able to appease someone who is narcissistic. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you know, we uh, we learn what love and affection looks like when we're little with certain types of people, and then that's what love and affection looks like from there on. That's my theory. Unless you, unless you re, perhaps maybe you relearn what that can be and what that can look like, right? That's what intimacy is. Like if you're, if you're a child of an alcoholic, I mean, that's, you know, that's the kind of person you're intimate with. I mean, that's just everything. It just sets your baseline for everything, you know. Uh, but attraction is so complex. Um, you know, there's a whole, when we see someone and we're attracted to them, there's a whole aggregate attraction score you're giving them you know it's not just their appearance it's the way they move the way you interact with them it's it's a whole bunch of stuff sure. and there's so much stuff that we're carrying around that can can feed or fuel or influence that attraction that we feel that we probably shouldn't trust it and, and that's where my comment about you know hey you know hire a detective because you know when you're in those in those early months or maybe even the early years of that relationship you, you, you're not seeing it like you would otherwise. If your friend, like your friend will date somebody, and you're like, good Lord, when well, she's a mess, her house is, it's not that she's untidy, her ma- house is gross. But I mean, we all know these stories. You're like, good yeah, Lord, sure. her house, I mean, there, she has roaches. And then every time I go see her at a dinner party, she drinks two and a half bottles of wine and like yeah. chips a tooth. And you're like, God, you know, S- Steve can't see it. Well, you can. Well, right. it, Steve's not dumb. <laughs> And and you're Steve when you're in your deal. So it's great, you know, when you've got this community, you know, y- you ask your people first, like, you know, what do you think of what do you think of Susan? You know, uh, I showed this list to someone from my Instagram, and one of her comments was that be wary of the person that doesn't want to meet your friend group or your family mm-hmm. until That's much later one. into the relationship. Um, and this person said, look it's, it's going to open you up to not having that early feedback from your people. What about the other way around? What about the person that doesn't want you to meet their friend group or family for right? Same thing. Not necessarily. What if their dad's a drunk? Well, I mean, well and mom, so I was going to ask, is that one of the, is that one of, because Scott, you and I talked about this. I can't remember if we talked about it on the podcast or just privately that my daughter is 14 she is, she is, we are very much into, hey, we become friends with people. You're 14 years old. You don't need, you know, you're 14. You're not, you're not ready for a relationship. That doesn't mean that, that attraction isn't something that naturally occurs. It does naturally occur. It's okay to be attracted, but let's become friends with this person first. And then we start to kind of walk through with our own kids. Like what are the things that are sort of major qualifications or disqualifications for a future potential mate? And the question is like, do we marry people with crazy families? And I, I think you got to be really careful here because everybody has right. people in their family that, right? So, but like, where do you draw the line? And we don't right. want to create a standard that is no one can meet. That's not what we're trying to do. But, uh, you know, if, 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 if dad is still part of the family and is addicted to black tar heroin, I think that's a, that, that may not totally disqualify the person, but I think that's a red flag of, man, this person's going to be in my life for the rest of, my life. When, when, I, when I look at that, I would look at, does this person um, have other mentors that they've picked up in their life that are strong, meaningful relationships? Because that's what I see a lot of the time. If, if a person grows up in a chaotic family like that, they'll often find organizations or situations where they can ha- be mentored and fathered or mothered by a community. And, and that's really important. You know, so I, it, for me, dysfunctional families aren't maybe a deal breaker, but it's like, how much do they want to be connected to that dysfunctional family and how oblivious are they to the dysfunction of the family? Yeah, You know, like if you're dating someone who still is highly connected to that heroin addict and listens Doesn't realize to that person yeah. and, you know, will listen to them above you, you know, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a red flag. Um, okay. Number five, I'm overly focusing on the positive things about them. Maybe one positive thing and not seeing all the other parts of them. This yeah. is normal for the first six months. though, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, would that's say the it's puppy like love stage. That's like what everyone goes through with love. It's like they become blinded to the faults of their, 
of their partner, right? Yeah. So yeah. is a good is a good piece of wisdom there. One of the things we've talked about before is we we don't we don't get married to that person. We don't get engaged to that person until that stage has passed. Like everybody recognizes in the beginning. Don't get married it, to them until you're tired of them. Is that what you just well, said? I mean, you, but you have to be able to see. So I mean, it's. it's I'm going to get, I don't, I don't mean this in a cheesy sort of way, but in the beginning, you're just like, you know, I remember when Rachel and I first started dating, like she could do no wrong. She was perfect. And that's not real love. That's like, that's, 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 that's a step moving that direction, right? You've got this puppy love, this sort of like, it's infatuation on some level and there can't really be a true depth to that love. And until you can actually see them warts and all, and then choose to still love them. Like I, I, in fact, I love you in spite of these things and also because of these wonderful things then you start to build some depth there now you know now rachel i've been together for 22 years and we know all the good and all the bad about each other and wouldn't wouldn't trade each other for the world but i think there's a red flag for me when somebody starts dating we see we actually see this a lot in 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 church in our in our church group of people who like they've never really even had a boyfriend or girlfriend and they and they start dating somebody and they're engaged in like three and a half months and they're married at six months and you go Whoa. like that's and 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 maybe they've known each other for a long time and maybe they're friends um, so maybe they you know they they grew up together so that some of these like things from the past that Scott's talking about we don't have a need to hire a a, pri- a private investigator or anything yeah. but but you're, they're still in the puppy love stage and then they have to go through the oh shit this person has problems. Post marriage, post wedding, but those are those are things that need to be worked out pre wedding. Does that does that make sense, Peter? What I'm saying? Like it's, yeah, yeah. I, I I mean, I think it's just something to be aware of, especially like if your guy friends are like, dude, you're not seeing, you know, this. You're not yeah. seeing what we're seeing. And then you know what will happen sometimes is you'll pull away from your guy friends or you'll pull away from your girlfriends who are who are like, dude, what are you thinking? Like, do you not see like what's going on here? And you're like okay, I guess we can't be friends anymore. It's like, I can't, yeah. I'm, you know. That, that, that brings up something very interesting. You know, you, you, you need to probably be the kind of person that can have good friends before you even consider getting married. You know, if you just got a bunch of beer drinking buddies and there's no depth there and, and uh, they're just going to say, hey, you know, we don't like her because you don't go, you know, you don't watch the game with us every Saturday now you know, you're, you're probably not ready to be married anyway. So you, you, know, you need to have some decent friends and be able to have had those kind of relationships. One, so they can give you some feedback and help you check your math. And two, so you can just be the kind of person that can have meaningful relationships. Oh, you know, David, we, were, we talked on the show before about people don't even have friends anymore. Like if you don't have friends, how the hell are you going to be married? Not that, you're, not that your spouse ends up being like a friend there is a friendship aspect, but it's something quite different, right? There is a there is a collegiality and a friendship thing that happens inside of marriage, but it's not like a it's not like your guy friends. It's not the same thing. I tell I tell my guy friends who are moving somewhere or something. I'm like, before you even start to think about dating, build some friendships. Yeah, you know, find a community, and um, don't be a lone wolf. Right. I think there's something there's something a little alluring about going to a new city and just kind of being, you know, alone, right? But at the same time, it's like uh, build, build, find some people with some commonalities, find a community, you know, get plugged in. Yeah. Okay. Number six. Does this person try to control everything about them, including me? Um, it's this is just a red flag, right? I mean, these are these are not all deal breakers, but if they're positive to all of these things then I would Mm -hmm. you know raise some some discussion at least does this person react to obstacles with anger rage blame and shaming others (laughs) yep yeah major red flag does this person blame others for their mistakes where they are in life or the problems they face this is a big one because like if their narrative is completely cohesively i'm a victim victim mentality i'm a a victim i got fired from my 10th job in the last year because my horrible boss and i just can't get a break with a good boss and you know it's like at some point you're like okay what what responsibility do you bear and you have to realize if your partner can take no responsibility for their choices 
for their life, then when you get into an argument with them, it will be completely your responsibility. Mm. That's good. Yeah, and you're behind the eight ball there. There's nowhere to negotiate from. There's no way to reconcile. It's just all your fault if you're in an in interaction with somebody like that. And some people like, have no ego strength to be able to receive feedback. They don't have the ability to see their own mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a major piece for us. Rachel and I had to work through how to conflict well in marriage. Like our, our friendship was great, but the conflict was tough. And to do that in a way where the, the ultimate goal was not to win, but to reconcile um, was really important for us to see. Like it doesn't matter. Married, doesn't matter who wins the argument. The goal is reconciliation there. And so that, that took some work for us, for sure. Does this person make impulsive decisions uh, with their choices, money, emotions? Does this person shut down, disengage, stonewall, go numb, emotionally distant themselves when stresses occur, like arguments? Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of both. A lot of people do this, but it's yeah. like if there's a very, very strong pattern, it can be really hard. It can be really hard to have conflict with someone who just stonewalls or disengages or detaches completely, goes numb. Yeah, that resolution, that reconciliation becomes impossible if someone if someone does any of these last three things that you've mentioned. Oh, here's a good one. Does this person still have emotional energy tied to past relationships? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are they over everybody? And uh, emotional energy could be anger as well. Like how much of their emotional day is spent having negative emotions towards their exes as well, right? And that's a problem because in the present, you'll pay for the sins of the ex. Is that one of the major, or is it just a bandwidth issue often? I think it, you know, these are not deal breakers, right? These are sure. just things to like raise your red flag of like, oh, is this a bigger issue? You know, I mean, like if the person has a ton of anger towards their ex, Anger can become jealousy pretty quickly, and jealousy is a mixture of anger and love. And so, you know, there's risk for you to be in a relationship where you have no, where your emotional energy is all tied up in this new relationship, and their emotional energy is still tied up in their old relationships. I want to bring something up that might not make the cut here. As people defer marriage into their later and later in life, there's this thing that has happened, and monogamy has decreased. There is a observable and provable trend towards the top 20% of men, uh, frankly, betting the top 80% of women, mm. right? Like you can see this. There was just a study put out about Tinder where the top 20% of the men on Tinder are getting like more than 80% of the matches, and that seems to be happening in the like the sexual marketplace, right? So it used to be back in the old days, like the football uh, cap team captain would date the head cheerleader. Well, they're monogamous and they're off the market. And now the co-captain or the, the the assistant captain or whatever dates the next cheerleader and whatever. And the next thing you know, to a guy that's a three and a girl that's a three, they can be boyfriend and girlfriend and have ugly babies one day, right? Well, well now though... The, with with the decrease of monogamy and people uh, deferring marriage, you end up with some somebody who's a five wait until closing time, and maybe every now and then getting hook up with a guy who's an eight. Now she thinks she's an eight. Now she thinks she's an eight. Right. And the next thing you know, does that through her twenties, and then when she's in her thirties, she's like, I will have to set. They settle. They settle. Like you hear For it. Six. Yeah. The weird thing is, is it's. it's I, I obviously I hate assigning a number to a person, but for the, the efficiency talk about of the it conversation, like. it's, it's it's a terrible thing. It's not what I mean, but the kind of left into that bell curve, the ones, twos, and threes are still fine. They work together. The real loser here is the middle of the bell curve male. Often, it's the four, five, and six guy who who ends up like they defer marriage. He can't for whatever reason, the, the guy that's kind of the middle of that bell curve, the average, the painfully average guy who's a perfectly good, fine person. Stand-up guy, just cannot, schlubby, Cannot awkward. find a match 
for himself on the other side because this because the female who's also in the middle of the bell curve has been able to at times go home with the eight nine ten guy and so and so and then they defer marriage and all of a sudden this this eight this girl who's a middle of the bell curve will settle for a guy that's in the middle of the bell curve and you're actually going like no you guys were supposed to be together all along and it creates this dysfunction in the marriage i think i think one of the bigger issues of this discussion is that we're just talking about attraction and so much of you know Tinder oh, why or some of these dating apps is is only attraction and that's the only like bell curve that we're looking at whereas there's like a multiplicity of different bell curves that people have sure. right for virtue is is one that used to be highly looked after it used mm -hmm. to be one of the top ones but now it's like way down on the list if you look at studies and you know looking at someone's character i know this guy whose character is like like i would i would trust this guy with my kids i would trust him with my bank account i would trust him you know there's like that's just who he is right he's struggling yep he's struggling finding a a, a dating partner and you know there, it's like, it's, so when we think about our dating partner, when we think about people, you know, if your only sort of bell curve that you're looking at is attraction, I would be very concerned for you. Well, but, but how do you get the first date? You know, in 2019, how do you get the first date? And the truth of it is, is attraction plays a big, big role in that. And yeah, if, there you're, isn't tender if you're for five virtue. foot nine... If you're if you're five foot nine, a guy, and you have a median income, and you have less than sparkling, you know, an, an introvert, you know, less than sparkling interpersonal skills, in the short attention span world that we live in, and kind of Instagram driven, where it's really tough for these gentlemen. It's yep. really tough. Yeah. No, I get it, and I think it's a numbers game at that point. So I tell guys, hey, go on coffee dates, sit across from the person, yeah. um, do an hour long date, have an end point and see if there's some connection that can start. And, you know, I, I meet guys who like they want to date, but they literally just go on, you know, one date every year almost. Yeah. It's like, dude, you got to get you're doing interviews. It, it's a job. You got to you got to decrease your fear of going on those first dates. Yeah. And the only way to do that is to do them and to do low intensity first dates, coffee shops, and do it over and over again. So I don't, I, I, I meet a lot of people who are just even fearful of doing that. Yeah. Sure. Well, and it seems like maybe the starting point, the best starting point for these guys is not Instagram and Tinder. It's being part of an authentic community somewhere like a, like a church or uh, you're a student at a school or because at that point you at least have an opportunity to, to interact with people in a safe environment uh, that, that that doesn't feel to that other person like, okay, this person is trying to be romantic with me, right? Like you have the opportunity to be present and listen well in a school setting, in a church setting, in a community setting of some sort that isn't, that you don't have the opportunity to show those skills on Tinder. Right. There is you, no way to listen on Tinder. You have right. to be part so, like, of the like you're not going to get your the reality is you're not getting the coffee date on Tinder. You're getting the coffee date because, you know, the girl that you were in small group with at church or that sat next to you in biology class. Like, hey, can we go get coffee at 9 a.m. before class? Well, like that's not that's not very that's not real high risk there. 9 a.m. versus 9 p.m. is a totally different deal. Like, hey, like, I just want to go get coffee. Right. Let's and we'll go get a coffee and then we'll walk to class. Yeah, it, there are a lot of studies out there about about Tinder and other online tools, and for for most guys, they're a dead loser. And I think that the key is to be in community. Hey, by the way, are they a winner for girls, Scott? I mean, that's the thing. It depends if, on if what you goal, want, right? If the goal is to if if the goal is to go home and sleep with somebody, sure, that's a winner. But like, ultimately, is ten, like it crushes me to see like you know we're part of. We're part of church communities and life group communities and and in our neighborhood. We're pretty close in our neighborhood. Like I hate to see people that I care about in their twenties and early thirties doing this thing because I go like, okay, but man, that's a that's probably a dead end road. Uh yeah. like long term, right? Like if the goal is to like, hey, just whatever. But that's not the goal, right? Like what that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about finding a mate. We're talking about finding a long term relationship that brings you joy. Um and, and it's it's just not being found there. 
Maybe we should go to my list. So we got through about half of the list. Oh my God, you took 20? You had 20? Peter, you brought 20 red flags? There's, there's 22. Oh my God. Okay, well, you're going to have to give them the... You, so you know that every single... Every person on this list is going to be a red flag for at least three or four, right? Was that Would that be right. fair? Like, like if you even judged yourself and you read through that, how many of those things would you say like, hey, there's, there's a handful of these that I'm a red flag for? Yeah, if you... If you only have a couple, then it's probably not a big deal. But if you have more like half of the list, you know. Um, but what I wanted to end on is the good signs. Yeah. The good things on the list, right? So um, like this person has close friends and meaningful, trusting relationships with their friends. That's a big, that's a big good one. Yeah. This person has integrity in how they deal with people, money, and their work. But how do you know that without the... Private investigator. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Because, How do you know if they have integrity with their money? Yeah. So let's. So here's the here's the thing we haven't talked about, David. There are people who are deceptive, right? There are people who um, are just. Is it sociopathy? You know? it's like so. The how do you find if someone's a primary psychopath or s- severe? Psychopath. Severe self-destructive person, right? And sometimes they can put on a social veneer yeah, there, for a long time. There are extraordinarily charming psychopaths out there mm. who can deceive you, particularly if you don't have experience with that and you don't have training. And then there are people out there that have borderline. And when they, when the border, borderline personality disorder, and when you're on the good side, it's euphoric, it's effusive, it's wonderful, and then when it goes bad, it is super, mega, ultra, terribly bad. And they are out there. And when you're in the throes of this, you know, those initial stages of attraction, which could last two years maybe even, I, I think you'd be oblivious to it, right? That's where you need your buddies to look in. And that that's something that's real, right? So I, I think, okay, one thing we're talking about is the, the, the primary psychopath, which... Let's say, I, I think that people with primary psychopathy can be pro-social. And I talk about that in my podcast. Um, the, the pro-social primary psychopath has morals and they live according to standards. They may not have affective empathy, so they don't feel into someone else's experience, but they've decided due to a series of beliefs to live life in a, in a way to benefit society. So there are those people, bomb diffusers, people with very little fear of doing very scary things. There are those people, right? So we shouldn't just judge a whole group of people who may not on the bell curve of affective empathy be very, very high, right? Right. Um, The the other group that we talked about is people with borderline personality disorder. So I would say, you know, are they in the midst of needing treatment or are they someone who has received very good treatment, right? This is a very different stages now wait a minute are people with borderline personality disorder in general actually treatable yes 100 percent um one of the like mentalization based therapy after they follow these people for five years after receiving this type of therapy for a good year or two years and then support groups after 90 percent of them or sorry 80 percent of them no longer met criteria for borderline personality Mm -hmm. disorder they no longer had self-harm. They no longer, um, you know, suffered from a lot of the stuff that they were suffering from. So I hate to stigmatize a group of people. When you're, when you're dating someone, you have to have a little bit of a judging hat. You have right? to. It's your life. You At a certain point, you decide like, okay, I'm no longer going to judge this person. I'm going to accept them. I'm going to marry them. I'm going to accept them for all their faults, and we're just going to grow together, Right. But I would say, on what level of chaos is this person living, right? And so I'm hesitant to just characterize or label, you know, because, I mean, it's going on right now. One of the big things that, you know, is this guy a narcissist? Is this girl a narcissist? And you have some person on YouTube telling you how to diagnose these things, and it's actually a lot more complex, right? Right. And so they're diagnosing someone who's a narcissist who actually has good connection with their friends, good connection with their families, very longitudinal relationships. That person's not usually a narcissist. Good boundaries looks like narcissism to some people. And once 
someone decides that their spouse or partner is a narcissist, it's like almost impossible to break that narrative. Yeah. And I've seen that in relationships. They'll come in and they'll say, my spouse is a narcissist. Tell them they're a narcissist. And I'm like, well, have, is that from your opinion or is that from a professional opinion? Sure. They're like, it's from my opinion, but I need your professional opinion to co-author <laughs> them. And the more I get to know the situation, it's like, you know, the person who's labeling the other person is using that label to defend against they have no wrong in their life. They have no errors. The other partner is the one with all the errors, right? And it's always, it's always a mix, right? We, so if you're only looking at the other person and judging the other person, then you're not looking at yourself. So, you know, as we go through this list, if you're listening to this and you're like, yeah, that puts me in a, a place of a judgment towards someone else. Yeah, that could be good, but you should also look at your own self and look at how to improve your own, your own life. So there are, I was thinking about this even before you addressed it just now, but I think it's important to note that, that all of us are bent in the direction towards some of these things. And so when you talk about like what the magnitude of chaos is for this thing, right? Like I can, as you read through the, those, that list, I go, Ooh, like I'm, I'm bent towards that. But I've also had six years of counseling that sort of worked through that. And so I think it's, it's probably important to note that just because someone is bent this way, that doesn't necessarily disqualify them as a future potential mate, especially if they've recognized that that is a thing and they've received help for that thing and they're not in the middle of the chaos of that thing. Yeah, is that there aren't fair? Perf- yeah, there aren't perfect people. Like we're, no, of course we're all going to, we're all flawed and, and, but, but actually we're all depraved, got, Scott. If you've got defect, if you've got deal breakers and you should, damn it, you need to be willing to break the deal when you observe that deal breaker. Yeah. Right. And you probably need to be looking for it. When I look at business deals, I'm always like, I'm looking for a reason for the heads for the exit. I'm not looking for a reason to do the deal. I'm looking for a reason to leave because it's easy to fall in love with the idea of, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make money. I'm always looking for a reason to leave. And I think you probably should be when you're dating up to, to an extent. But then once you're married, then it's the unconditional thing. Right? Yeah, we're in. You, yeah. You've, you've looked. You're like, this is adequate. This per- I value this person for these reasons. I value the relationship for these reasons. And then once you're married, you're in. And now you've gone into it with your eyes open. And you've had all the data in front of you. You made a rational decision as so, insofar as we can. And now you're committed. And now you do the thing until one of you throws dirt on the other one. I think like, okay, so how someone responds to feedback is so important. So, you know, do you feel safe giving feedback to this person? Like, how do they respond to that? Right. Do they respond with complete anger, denial, blaming, right? Or do can they actually take a little bit of that, think through it? How do they grow? You know, what is their history with growth yeah. when they hit tough patches? And we all react if somebody gives you some feedback. But, you know, the next day, are they like, hey, man, I overreacted there. I thought about that. You're right. Yeah, so I think what is the what is the purpose of this, right? The, and we're talking about the purpose is forming a relationship which will lead to thriving in your life. And not all relationships lead to thriving, right? Mm-hmm. And it would, I think it's really hard early on in a relationship to see some of these blind spots. And so I think that's where the community, your friends, your family Detectives. become so important. And I think largely in our culture, we sort of pushed away from that. So we're kind of trying to maybe pull it back towards like, hey, how do we bring in some other sort of people who maybe are a little bit more objective, who are seeing this thing a little bit more clearly and seeing if we have blind spots, you know, just like in our own life, right? So when I meet with my accountability partners, my mentors, you know, where are my blind spots? Um, What am I not seeing that I don't know? You know, not knowing what we don't know is the day, is where we get into um, trouble. You know, as a physician, that's where I get into trouble. If I don't know what I don't know, right? That's when I can make a mistake. And then it's like, I don't even know that I've made the mistake, you know? So I think more than anything, this discussion is kind of like, how do we accurately assess reality, truth, mm-hmm. right? Um, in, in prior episodes, we've talked about connection, 
right? And connection is beautiful. We want to have that. But we also want to have an aspect of truth that we bring into how we see the world, how we see ourselves, how we see other people. And I think what the big point that I'm taking away is we don't want to go into a relationship blind and we don't want to miss what we're, what we may not know that we don't know. The unknown unknowns. It's good. Those are scary. Let's keep talking about this. Let's do a part two Yeah, on it. Dr. Peter, that sounds good. thank you so much for giving us some of your valuable time and insights. I can't, can't thank you enough. It really means a lot to me, and I hope it means as much to the people that listen as, as it does to me. Thank one, you. One more thing. If we put this thing out and we're going to do a part two, we should get questions from people. Uh-oh. That'd be good. So I don't Let's know, do I don't know if, if people can email you guys questions or, yeah. or thoughts, and we'll read some of those things and just have that be part of our dialogue. You heard it straight from the doctor. Send your questions about this to questions at barbell-logic.com and put Dr. Pewter in the uh, subject, subject line, line. Yeah. and then we will, we will crack those open for part two and three and part four <laughs> <laughs> of, of this show. This is the most important uh. thing that you guys are going to do, and even if you don't do it, the not doing it was the most important thing in your life. So uh, we, we're going gonna, we're gonna to talk about this. Thank you guys so much for listening. Come for the barbells. Get an earload of some other stuff. Keep coming back, and uh, we'll keep trying to provide you with the finest in personal improvement infotainment here at the uh, Barbell Logic Podcast. Thanks for listening, guys. Talk to you next week. Money doesn't grow on trees, but they do print that shit.